Greetings, salutations, respect, and love. I am Scott, and you're in the prog corner, and today I got a good one for you, man. I told you Monday I was going to do a new one by a UK group, but I realized that the new Scion album doesn't come out until November 17th, and that's a little bit too early. I don't want to do an album review for something that comes out like three weeks from now, and if you guys want to get a hold of it and you can't, so I switched gears, and I'm doing a record that dropped... Uh, a uh, couple months ago, we're doing the Ring Van Mobius album. Uh, I'm so excited. These guys were formed in uh, 2014 in Carmoy, Norway. They dropped their first album in 2018, Past the Evening Sun. Cool, cool record. Only had uh, three songs on it, including uh, the 21-minute title track. And then in 2020, they dropped their fantastic second album, The Third Majesty, which included a 22-minute epic. Uh, the Seven Movements of the Third Majesty. Just awesome stuff. Um, and that brings us to the third album, uh, Commissioned Works Part 2, Six Drops of Poison. This was uh, released on Apollon Records on July 14th, so I'm super late. Uh, why am I doing this record? Well, like I said, the Scion record was next up, but uh, I messed up on the release date. That's number one. And number two, I just can't seem to stop listening to this, man. I was not going to review this. I didn't think it was as good as their first two, but I was wrong. Man, I was dead wrong. First of all, look at the cover art, man. Uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, Nectars. Sounds like this, uh, but it's a great, great image. Um, and another reason I'm doing this review is I... You know, as I prep for these reviews, I look to see who's all reviewed the album and what they had to say about it. I found Precious Little Prog Magazine uh, did a write-up on it. Uh, Pete Pardo over at Sea of Tranquility did an album review. And one website, uh, Echoes and Dust, did a, a review. And that's it. I haven't seen anything else about this record. And that's a shame. It's fantastic. So, who's Ring Van Mobius? Uh, who's in the band? What are they? Well, they're a three-piece, like I said, out of Norway, a keyboard player named Thor Erickson Helgeson. He also sings. Man, he brings a whole entire battery of uh, keyboard sounds to the festivities. Just amazing. Uh, the drummer also provides backing vocals. That's Dag Olaf Husas. And then the bass guitar player is Havard Rasmussen. And that's it. These guys are awesome, man. Look at them. They look like rock stars. They look like Vikings, uh, you know, ready to do some pillaging on a foreign shore. This album uh, came to life in a really strange way. They were working on their third album when they got a phone call from a guy named uh, Harold Bahari, who was a choreography, and he was working on a new dance, a new ballet piece called uh, Batty Bois, uh, and uh, it's about a Jamaican uh, black queer self-consciousness. I guess Batty Bois means a gay man. See, when I lived in the islands, they uh, they call them Batamans. Uh, so I guess uh, the slang has changed since I lived in the Caribbean back in the 70s. So this guy, Harold, did a Google search for uh, Norwegian prog bands to help flesh out this project, came across Ring Van Mobius, gave him a call, asked him if they'd be interested in providing the music for this ballet, uh, which they said yes to, putting on hold their third album. So this is their third album. I guess their fourth album is going to be that stuff that they were working on uh, prior to getting the phone call. And this dance performance opened in Oslo in January 2022 to rave reviews. I guess is still showing in Oslo. Uh, so why is this commission works part two? Well, apparently they got commissioned to do a new version of Suspiria. I guess the Goblin version and the Tom York version wasn't enough. I guess we needed a third version. Uh, but yeah, man, uh, Ring Van Moby is being a three-piece uh, keyboard uh, centric type of prog band. Certain bands come to mind immediately. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Le Orme, Triumvirate, and all of those comparisons are accurate. If you throw in there a little bit of Vandergraaf Generator, well, actually a lot of Vandergraaf Generator, you got a real good idea what these guys sound like. Uh, their mission statement is to write and uh, record music that sounds like it came straight out of 1971. And man, do they ever succeed. This record has 12 tracks to it. So it's a big departure from their first two albums, which are, you know, really dominated by those epic tracks. But don't be fooled. All these songs link together thematically. There's certain motifs that uh, carry on throughout the album. And if, you know, breaking this thing up into 12 parts isn't enough, some of these actually have subsections too. It's just crazy. 
Uh, so yeah, they're getting real detail oriented in their ID points here, but it opens with chapter one elements, three and a half minutes. Uh, it's kind of a slow awakening. Uh, you really don't know where it's going. Certain themes are introduced and then they quietly disappear and they move on to uh, other things. But when the vocal is uh, sung, the edge of the knife divides more than fire above and below. You know you need to pay attention to that. That riff's coming back many times in the album. Next up is a one minute track, chapter two. Uh, the Fire Part 1. It's a fast church organ running arpeggios in D major with bass and drum kind of accenting and expected to go somewhere. It doesn't. It just falls off. And then you get chapter three, movements, uh, moments and movements, six and a half minutes. This is kind of like the first real song on the album. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it definitely makes me think of ELP and Egg is another three-piece band. I want to mention that these guys remind me of. Uh, you get the first uh, appearance of the drifting section, which is one of the coolest chord progressions I've ever heard, man. Check this out if you're a musician. How do you go from B minor to F to A minor to G sharp minor back to B minor? It totally makes sense. It's a ridiculous chord progression, but I absolutely love it. Lots of detail on this song, a whole bunch of keys, every conceivable uh, keyboard configuration from, you know, Moog sound and stuff to Hammond organ sound and stuff to the Mellotron. Just incredible. Great track. Next up is another little, uh, you know, piece that really just kind of acts as a link between uh, the chapters, chapter four through Oceans of Glass. Uh, it's the intro to the next song. It's kind of Procol Harum meets Wagner. There's like a Wagner do, 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 kind of reminds me of you know, Ride of the Valkyries a little bit, but uh, that leads us right into chapter five, which is just incredible. Oh man, this whole thing is built on this incredible descending chord progression in A minor. It just drops all the way down A minor to G to F to E minor to D minor to C to B flat back down to A minor. Just incredible. And the whole while you got a little toggle between the E and the F uh, going back and forth throughout the chord progression. It's just a real, real neat sound and trick. It slows down at the end, uh, kind of in diminution, and that adds a whole lot of power to the festivities. Uh, the sixth chapter called Hex is probably the best thing here. Really weird, really cool, crazy syncopation, like, you know, crazed circus music. Uh, I'm thinking, like, some stuff off of uh, maybe PFM's third album or uh, Leormi's uh, Contrapunti here. There's a tribal section. The bass and the drums really do sound like they're from 1971, man. The way they mic the drums in particular, real unique. Takes some getting used to. Uh, this is an instrumental track. It's definitely a highlight. Kind of kraut rocky. Really good. Um, one of the things people have you know, that holds them back about this band are the vocals. Uh, Thor's vocals are a little different, man. They take a little getting used to. So that sixth song being an instrumental, that might be a good place to start. Uh, chapter seven and ending. It starts with the you know, real weepy, wailing Mellotron with some warped guitar in the intro. It's the only time I can even hear any guitar on this album. And then there's some narration here, which definitely links it to the Italian prog scene, which always did a lot of instrumentation. And if you think about Suspiria and Goblin and the, and the you know, Italian prog connection, definitely makes sense. Uh, after the narration, just a gorgeous instrumental passage. Uh, short track takes you to the eighth chapter, A Darker Poison. You got a real dramatic, like, Rachmaninoff piano, and he's toggling back and forth between A minor and F, and it gets all dramatic and theatrical. It's a good piece. Sets you up for the ninth chapter. Echoes. Starts with the Rhodes uh, piano. That drifting theme returns again. That crazy B minor, F, A minor, G sharp minor chord progression that I just love. And then from out of nowhere, man, you get an Aquatarchus section. Sounds like it's straight out of a ELP's 1971 masterpiece. Just a great track. The 10th chapter is called Paradoxal Fate. It's a hard charging, uh, heavy prog song, which was really needed. You have all these like dreamy passages and you just needed some kind of moderate kind of beat getting you going. This song absolutely does it. You get a little more narration and you get that drifting theme come in and again. 
The 11th chapter is called The Nine, and it's uh, basically got that fire theme, that Wagnerian theme again, but with some really cool replacement chords. Definitely making me think of Triumvirate here. Uh, the last section is real syncopated, and listen in the background, there's some really cool piano chords getting played at the end of this track. Unexpected, cool, amazing. The final track is called The Conclusion, and it's five and a half minutes long. You get a church organ starting out, kind of making you think of Bach or ELP. Uh, a little more spoken word, but he actually adds some singing while he's doing it. Lots of variations to the main chord progression here as we go through a lot of the themes that we've heard throughout the album. And then you get that edge of the knife theme again. The edge of the knife divides more than fire above and below. It's so great. And then, you know, we're mixing these different themes together. And then we end up on a real discordant, uh, uh, dissonant kind of chord that just sounds really cool. And then it's over. This album's only like 44 minutes long. It is designed to be listened to in one sitting even though broken up into 12 parts. So many themes return over and over again. It is basically one long track. I absolutely love this thing. What am I going to score? Well, you know, Thor's vocals are a little bit of a problem, but man, the more I listen to this album, the more I realize that it absolutely fits this music perfectly. I have zero problem with his singing. I love this band. Yeah, maybe they could throw a little more guitar in there from time to time. You know, Greg Lake picked up a guitar every once in a while, so, you know, I don't know why they don't either, but my score, yeah, my score. I'm giving this puppy 9 out of 10, man. I'm really digging it. I'm so happy uh, that I took the time with this record spent a lot of time with it. I've probably listened to it 40 or 50 times now. It's just dynamite. Definitely going to be uh, a factor on my year-end lists. Anyway, that's it for me, man. Check in Sunday. We're doing uh, the History of Yes Part 2, 1987 to 2023. We did Part 1 last Sunday, but we ran out of time. It was supposed to be a standalone episode, but 90 minutes isn't enough to talk about 23 Yes albums and, you know, 400 different Yes members over the years. So we're going to do part two Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Be there. Anyway, peace in the Middle East. God save the king. I love you guys. I'll see you next time.